discussion today with uh, two really great minds. They're also the founders of uh, two very public and global platforms that are together trying to, um, you know, influence the impact investing industry and uh, and have continuously um, questioned uh, our motives, our work, and have been pioneers in in the impact investing space. So without uh, further ado, I would like to begin by giving you all a very, very short introduction of what today's panel is going to focus on and then uh, request both Kevin and Vineet to um, give us their opening remarks. The impact investing industry is a relatively new space. Uh, however, it is growing very rapidly and with rapid growth comes uh, you know, great challenges. And uh, some of these challenges include uh, the intent of investing, especially when we're trying to create impact, we're trying to reduce vulnerabilities, uh, and we're dealing with very systemic issues. Um, and over the years, the term impact and impact investing has been romanticized by many and critiqued by an equal number. In today's webinar, we're going to take a look at this industry's evolution and answer uh, some of the questions that are staring us in the face on what next and how do we move from here. But before we go into that, I did want to put some context to the impact investing industry. According to a recent uh, Gin and Cambridge Associate report, um, impact investment funds tend to be very small. 27 of the 51 funds that were analyzed were less than $50 million in size. While in the larger universe of investing, over 71% of the funds have more than $100 million uh, uh, in their fund size. This combined with a vintage of not more than 10 years is the reality of our industry. So are we then expecting too much um, too soon? Are we growing too big for our own goods? How do we address some of these mounting concerns and present a real picture for impact investing for now and as we go forward? So with these very, very pertinent and some, somewhat existential questions, I'm going to uh, request uh, both Vineet and Kevin to uh, come in with their opening remarks um, and talk about what they think the impact investing industry's performance has been till date. Maybe we can start with Kevin. Ah, thank you, Kanika. Um, is the sound working? Can you hear me? Yes, good. Okay, I, I am assuming that's yes. Uh, okay, great. So, I want to, since these are existential questions, I want to ask a, f a further question. Is this an industry, and is defining it as an industry something that is helpful or hurting? I think at its heart, this is a movement fueled by moral hunger that uses the market, and the more we let the market and the traditional system frame what we were doing, the more we were replicating the game of empire and colonialism. You know, at its worst, I think impact investing is just a carryover of Victorian uh, imperial philanthropy, trying to fund the deserving poor. Uh, at its best, it's something like, say, Keisha Cash, an African-American venture capitalist in uh, the U.S., who is investing in things like salons uh, for African-American hair stylists and letting them own the product, that the, the hair extensions, rather than uh, uh, buy those from other folks. And so they can make as much as $300 more a month when they're only making uh, 24000 But that's a thing where she understood the market, she understood the people, and it's not a white do-gooder trying to come in and help people, but it's someone who actually understands the needs of the market, and she got not an impact investor, but she got Andreessen Horowitz, who sees that this is a huge market and poor folks pay too much or they don't make enough wealth, and so that's a huge market. So I think at its best, it is led by the people who know the people they're trying to help. Thanks, Kevin. Benita, do you want to add your comments? Yeah, no, Kevin has this great ability to actually bring in abstractism to something very precise, so let me actually keep things very simple. Uh, to me, impact investing uh, was really uh, a conflicted thought process from the time it started. Uh, I was there in 2008 where the name was coined, and it was very clear right at that point of time that we will continue to t have a tug of war between the impact folks and the investing folks. 
Uh, I think in 2008 when people actually coined the term, there was a very great belief amongst most of them that impact is guaranteed if the question is only whether we can generate returns. Uh, I think 10 years down the line, uh, what is clear is that you can make money, but can you really make impact? Uh, and that uncertainty has completely reversed. So we are at 180 degree of where we were 10 years back. What is impact investing? Uh, I think that really, if one goes by gin and try to, well, there are questions about who accepts gin definition and who doesn't. But assuming for a minute that they have put in a definition, there are two important questions that come out. One is actually the intent. Uh, probably one of the best ways to guise something because nobody knows what my intent is and there is if until unless you codify the intent and explicitly come out with it there is no way one can actually understand how your intent is changing over a period of time so really saying that a intent of the investor defines his uh, impact credentials uh, is something which I believe is very questionable until unless it is codified the other part of it is reporting of impact. That's roughly $20,000 in any part of the global economy. Roughly hire an analyst and ask him to count every human being that your business model develops. So my question has always been existential from the perspective of definition. Intent, which is very superfluous and can be moved in any direction you want to. And uh, impact, which is $20,000, because finally it's counting number of people and putting them in different boxes and structures. If that's what impact investing is, I surely am not an impact investor and I would not like to be part of this movement. As uh, Kevin actually mentioned that uh, impact investing is really about a moral hunger, a desire for some people to actually go that extra mile to make a difference. I think that's really what I believe impact investing is. While we can try to codify it, we can try to report impact, but if you don't bring in the desire to make the difference and therefore emphasize or demonstrate it by questioning yourself, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a marathon that you are running against yourself and not against a crowd. And I think these are some of the opening remarks that I have. Uh, good enough to provoke a lot of people. Uh, I'm not a nice here, I'm actually an optimist. But I do genuinely believe that we are not here to actually count human beings as numbers and report them in different beautiful graphics as impact. Uh, thank you, Vineet and Kevin. After those uh, very, very... Um, powerful opening statements. Um, what I'd like to dig deeper is, um, Kevin, you had made a statement about, uh, you know, uh, making sure that the venture is not non-extractive, that we don't take out more than we put in. Is that uh, one way of, of maybe measuring impact and being true to the intent of creating impact? Do you think those kind of transformative finance principles are what is required? And, and do you see that in practice today? Um, you know, it's interesting because I am managing uh, a traditional, traditional in the time signature of it, uh, impact fund, Good Capital's first social enterprise impact uh, expansion fund, and we have a time basis, and we're measured on uh, on internal rate of return, which is how fast you make the money and how fast you bring it back. That is the venture capital metric. You know, that is also a pirate's metric. And I think the metric of venture capital doesn't work with impact. So um, I think we're lucky in our fund that we will be exiting our companies and uh, they won't have to sell and they, they are still going to be able to do good as we exit. Uh, both of them are able to, to doing well enough to help us exit. But I think uh, venture capital's metric does not equate with imp with impact you know the, the the traditional time signature of internal rate of return is not synonymous and is not consonant with it doesn't fit with uh, actually making a difference and so uh, I think you can use risk capital for good but you have to use a, a different way of, of measuring the the time of return and dethroning the traditional uh, you know uh, a venture capital metric of, of internal rate of return, which is just purely time-based. All it means is how fast did you get the money uh, back and, and how much money did you get. That's that's all it measures. So, you know, to what extent are these the new funds, you know, just using internal rate of return as a metric? If you're using that as a metric, you really can't do impact right. Uh, so that's, that's, but if you use uh, not you know, the transformative finance uh, folks who, who use non-extractive uh, impact, and they have three other parts of it, including the community in on the entrance, 
including the community and on the design and including the community and on the exit, I think is, uh, those are really key metrics. And I think those are, those are things that we need to think about. Great. Um, so we need moving to you. You manage um, quite a few funds, and and you certainly have have quite an opinion about the way we measure impact. Um, as as Avishkar, how do how do you see your impact being created through your enterprises? Uh, do you use the principles that Kevin was referring to, or you have often also referred to taking risk as also being one form of measuring impact and impact investing? So how would you compare? what's happening to what should happen? Uh, I think uh, some of the challenges of doing what we do is there is actually a lot of blurring of lines and a lot of things that we say can be construed wrongly as well. But let me start by saying that one of the basic premise of actually being different as an impact investor would mean that you would actually participate in value creation rather than participate in value participation. That means if you are not doing something very different and unique, from what other investors are already doing, then why should you be called an impact investor? That's actually one question. And that's where I bring in out, one of the themes people have been trying to bring out is saying that we are actually reporting impact. And I say that in a $100 million fund, $20,000 is what you will spend on reporting impact. Maybe $30,000. Is that really sufficient to be different? I think the question of risk, question of actually doing something which is additional and different, uh, stems from the fact that it is not good enough to actually take money from somebody and give it to somebody and say that the impact is always made by the enterprise. The question of impact actually lies squarely on the shoulder of the fund itself. And therefore, I as a fund manager is equally responsible for making the impact as is the entrepreneur who actually takes the product, makes the product or the service or creates the job or the livelihoods or reduces vulnerability for the people. So how do you actually they bring back the accountability of making a difference on the shoulders of the fund manager who are very willingly and in a very rapid manner trying to transfer it to the entrepreneur. Uh, knowing well that starting a business and running a business is very challenging and some of those metrics could actually be how much risk is the investor taking, how much additional thing that he is doing, how far in the geography is he going. What kind of business models is he bringing to the table? Is there something new? Is there a first time effect? Is there a pioneering role is he playing? Or is it just participating and doing the same thing that many other mainstream investors are doing? And I think that's really the crux of it. The crux is not really just about risk. The crux is actually, do you have the willingness and desire to stand up and define and codify what your intent is? And once you have done that, probably after that you report that impact in line with what your intent was, makes an impact investor and not just creating outputs uh, using analysts. Right. So, uh, so would we be right in assuming that impact measurement or uh, or assuming higher risk or assuming more patience in in capital is is one of the biggest challenges that the impact investing industry is currently struggling with, and maybe that's something we need to delve more into as we move towards impact investing 2.0? We need or Kevin, either of you. <laughs> I, I'll take this for a minute actually. I think sure. uh, the, f the first step that we are actually dealing with right now is exhorting the impact investor to stand up and say why is he an impact investor. I think to me that's step number one and that's actually impact investing 1.0. If you want to move to impact investing 2.0, you have to actually then talk about capital efficiencies. And when you talk about capital efficiencies, you have to reverse the efficiency and actually say, did your capital actually create something that created a difference? Because if creating jobs is actually an indicator or going into rural India is an indicator, buying stocks of Unilever is a much better impact investment than actually trying to create an enterprise. I think the challenges and metrics have to be redefined and rediscussed if we have to attract more capital. Remember that it is not the impact investor who has the control over patience and risk. It is the impact investor's limited partners from where he raises the capital, where the challenge lies. And that's where I think the role of institutions like Global Impact Investor Network or India Impact Investor Council is to bring together the people who are taking the capital like us 
and those whose capital it is, the pension funds, the development finance institutions, the family foundations who actually want to participate in our funds to make them have a dialogue that brings this question on, are we really patient? Do we really want to be patient? Is there actually a time value for money that is uncompromising? And if so, how do you actually take risk and create a new kind of impact to bring the money back? And really, to me, that actually is the 2.0. Unfortunately, we are still struggling to define the 1.0. Uh, Kevin, would you have remarks to this? Yeah, uh, you know, and I think the gears metrics, as laudable as they are, were basically an attempt to validate the market to Wall Street. And that was to show that it's big, it's real, it's growing. And when we did the SOCAP conference, Social Capital Markets, Market at the Intersection of Money and Meaning, it's the largest conference in the world, it's the same thing. We want to validate the market. But they aren't of any real value to any company. I mean, if, if you look at one of my companies, uh, in, in my portfolio company, Alter Eco, it's uh, doing fabulously well. It's about, you know, it's grown 12x in revenue since we invested four years ago. Uh, and it's uh, quinoa, uh, chocolate, organic, fair trade. But the, the, the things they've done beyond that are huge. And, you know, they've made the, the packages compostable. So you can throw away the truffles and your waistline grows, but your footprint goes down. And they've, uh, beyond biodiversity, they've, they've, and they've been carbon negative for two or three years. This last year, they're carbon negative by incest. So that means that the groundwater and biodiversity around commercial farming is actually higher because of commercial farming. Look, no metric measures the real value that they create. And I think if you look at the best companies, very few to any metric, it, it is unique and individual and complex, whereas Gears is a broad, linear thing to show the size of the market. So I don't think we have uh, metrics that are that are geared for complexity. It's it's it, it, it was they, they were okay to go in, which is also kind of why you know, hype has a, a reason to, to get us on the block, and now we don't need the hype anymore. So I think we need more complex, subtle, uh, multidimensional metrics. Uh, and there are some out of, coming out of, uh, like, the Oxford Poverty and Human uh, 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 Indicators uh, out, of, out of Oxford uh, and some other places. There are, com there, are, there are more complex metrics of what impact really is. Uh, I think the work that Sabina Alkir is doing around that is, is being adopted by aid agencies. But that means you have to get rid of the, the idea that size matters and that, that more money matters. You have to actually measure stuff with such you know, social complexity. That's why the Keisha Cash example, you know, Andreessen Horowitz was not encumbered by a theory of change, so they were able, where impact investors weren't, uh, to invest in an African-American uh, VC going after the hair salon market be, because it's going in someplace new and the folks from Stanford and MIT don't know how to look at that problem so they didn't do it whereas the really brilliant uh, venture capitalists like Andreessen Horowitz did. So I think sometimes the traditional in, uh, investors can find the better deals because we're hampered by the way we think and it's time to get rid of better metrics that are more complex, deal with complexity, deal with context, deal with cultural literacy. Uh, and I'd like to see some of that stuff happen. Great. So this is sort of bringing out two um, uh, two points are hitting me. Um, one is, uh, is there too much hype around impact investing? Are we expecting too much impact uh, too soon? Uh, or um, And are we really targeting the right kind of impact? Is impact investing designed to solve larger systemic problems or do we need to be real and and uh, realize its limitations um, so do you think there is too much hype associated with impact investing and too many expectations that come along with that hype and how do we break that and make it more real for for people who are not you know close enough to impact investing but have very high expectations of it uh, Vineet, do you want to go I think the challenge with hype, so first and foremost, everybody loves hype. I would be the last guy to say that we don't want hype. Hype is actually a good thing, uh, specifically when you are actually very small and inconsequential in the game. If you don't shout aloud, nobody will not be heard. So hype is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with it. And the more hype impact investing is good for us. The point is not really about hype. The point is actually what message and what expectations you are setting when you are being hyped up. Microfinance suffered very badly by actually saying that we are not really a business of bringing a certain kind of uh, 
uh, certain kind of uh, people into the banking mainstream, but by saying we will remove poverty, uh, the truth is microfinance cannot remove poverty. It's far too complex for microfinance to do it. I think the chain challenge that impact investing is facing is the potential that it holds is actually being misconstrued and missold. Uh, impact investing is basically a simple act of some people with money taking a calculated risk in making investments, in discovering markets, in actually coming up with businesses that are investing in businesses that are working with a, pers a, a person or a client or a customer with a very small wallet, which essentially means the chance of you making money is difficult, not impossible. And this actually does not make a rich person poor, a poor person rich or a rich person poor. Uh, the expectation that we will, in impact investing, solve the world's problem is a misplaced expectation. It's romanticized and is a very wrong way to do it. Yes, you will be able to bring a significant amount of population that is marginalized into uh, an economic activity or participate in something which may benefit, can create value, and surely create significant benefits for the sum. But there is always a flip side to every commercial activity because finally it's a trade-off. The products that we make may may not necessarily reduce vulnerability. The livelihoods that we may create can bring in some other mad, bad messages associated with it. Uh, something that we are trying to do which should not pollute may pollute. We really do not know what kind of impacts we are going to make. What we surely can say, and this is exactly where the gin definition has its value, that these are the set of people who have the right intent and they are actually trying to take every precaution to make the right kind of impact. That's really, we are actually not making impact, we are claiming that we are making an impact. There is absolutely no way to find out whether you are making an impact. The simplistic answer is, have you created jobs? The answer is yes, but then any business creates jobs. So does this mean every business is a social enterprise? Is real estate, which actually every five-star hotel you make, is that a social enterprise? And I think those are very existential and very simple questions. Really the challenge lies in trying to make these, finding answers to these questions. And the real challenge therefore is not really about whether hype is needed or not, whether the hype is actually about creating expectations that we are never going to meet. And I think that's where the fear starts about the hype. Great. Uh, Kevin, what are your thoughts on hype and, and the actual impact that impact investing can create? Yeah, I, I agree with the need that hype is needed. And I also agree with him that the risk of that is that it does create unrealistic expectations. I mean, the market solves some problems. It doesn't solve all problems. I'm, in the U.S., Yes, I think the, the, there are occasionally places where the market injustice overlaps, and the, the uh, space of financial inclusion is one right now, making money, reducing the cost of being poor. Poor people in America, probably other places, but I know the U.S. market, are incredibly victimized. It, it costs so much to be poor because they, they pay all kinds of other transaction fees that I don't pay that other people don't pay. And so things that are, that are working on financial inclusion are, it really can be market rate because there, there's such a, an, an, an entrenched systemic injustice around what they pay that you can make a good business and still reduce the cost of being poor and your impact there is relatively easily measured. Did you reduce the cost of being poor? But it doesn't solve all kinds of things. I mean, I, I noticed today there is a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a a vaccine almost ready in malaria and I worked two years in malaria and there is no real market opportunity around malaria. The people there are just too poor. There is no money to be made if you have to give in order to make that happen. The Gates Foundation uh, several years ago when I was, uh, more than a decade ago when I was working on it, uh, 15 years ago, uh, realized that you know uh, three-fourths of the people who could who needed the vaccine would actually need to be subsidized. So that's why research there is, has been so slow. So there are places where the market solves a problem and then an entrepreneur solves a problem, but so many places it doesn't do that. And so I think it can be a force for helping solve the problems of the world, but it doesn't solve all those problems. It, it, the market is a limited tool, but it, it's been a tool where investing was just for financial return and now it is also for doing some good. That's a major shift. And I think maybe the biggest thing that's happening is that it's causing people to think differently about themselves and their money. There really is, a, we've used the word existential, but there really is an existential shift when you become an impact investor. You have 
decided something different about what is yours and what is ours and your relationship to the world and stuff and how much is, is for you and how much is for everybody has changed and there's too little about that because I think we've been worried about becoming credible as an industry when I don't think we are an industry. I think we are still a movement that just uses the market as a tool. Great. Actually, that that uh, leads me very well into my next question. Um, and I'm pulling out questions from what some of our participants have already uh, put in. So a lot of the questions were around, um, should impact investing uh, and if we're still saying we're not an industry as yet and we're yet to, to, to become as big, should we become that big? Should we go mainstream? And if we do, how do we go mainstream? How do we involve retail investors? How do we involve the larger uh, financial institutions and, um, and sensitize them to, to some of the challenges that we're already facing? Um, Vineet, do you want to go? Yeah, I think it's actually an interesting question. First and foremost, let's actually try to understand what do they mean by mainstream. If the mainstream is actually, there, first there is already a mainstream, so uh, we don't need to actually have impact investing to go mainstream. But what I really understand from the question is that can you actually raise capital that is from the mainstream people instead of exceptional people so that you can increase the kitty of impact investing. My, my guess is that's really the question and not necessarily that should we start investing into real market stocks or in Wall Street. Uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, are we big enough? Should we become big enough? Well, I think the reason we all exist is because we want to actually push a large amount of capital to go towards this side. But the problem is if we do not know which side we are pushing the capital to, uh, when we are actually still debating, are we actually be aware of what our, our claims about impact are they right? Do we actually really believe what our expectations are from what we are doing? Is this actually about patience? Is this about actually taking risk? Or is it actually about just returning capital in a faster manner, which venture capital is already doing? I think the real question before we actually start attracting capital, and I think you will never stop attracting capital from everybody and anybody. We will go to pension funds, we will go to crowdsourcing, we will use, go to retail markets, we will go to anybody and everybody seeking money. The problem is the money will not come to you until unless you have answered these questions categorically and very clearly, articulating them and defining yourself where you can replicatively continue to pour this money to create the benefits that you are claiming you are creating. Money that is coming from mainstream sources is very risk averse does not like to pursue, follow those people who are unclear about what they are doing. And hence, the need for clarity is important before you can actually have the world open doors and pour their money into your bucket so that you can see, you can sow the seeds of impact investing and scale them to make bad entries. Okay. Um, Kevin, can you also respond to this? But just before that, to all our participants, uh, there's a poll out there. You can answer. Um, and this is um, going to the previous question around hype or substance in impact investing. And once you answer, we will collect your uh, your responses and share it. So, Kevin, uh, going to you about mainstreaming impact investing and 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 you know when should we or should we and how do we engage the larger financial market? Right. Well, mainstreaming. You know, I think in some sense, some people want it. As Vinny said, maybe it's about accessing capital. Or maybe it's about domesticating something that could be uh, structurally and systemically disruptive and taming it and co-opting it. Uh, you know, th there are a lot of things around uh, mainstreaming that are, are troubling questions. You know, uh, the powers that be, the imperial colonial forces that still run the U.S., that still run the IMF, that are, is oppressing Greece with a bailout that we all know won't work, uh, you know, those forces are not benevolent. And so, you know, there is much about capitalism that has been shown by Piketty's research to be inherently uh, extractive on a systemic basis. You know, we're taking more out of the earth than we can. So I don't know that I want to sign on to being mainstream if mainstream means the, the Washington global neoliberal consensus where, you know, a, a firm like Goldman Sachs buys one of the largest uh, advisory firms. And so what happens? Because we know Goldman Sachs is not a firm that is about good. Goldman Sachs will bet against its clients and will bet for its clients and play both sides. 
what happens when something like Goldman Sachs tries to come in and ha if they're buying something with a major presence? Uh, what's the risk of going mainstream? What di and it goes back to Vinny's question: What difference do we want to make? I think this is you know, it is fueled by a moral hunger. It uses the market, and the the more that we adopt the terms of the market and come into compliance, the more that we'll be co-opted, and it's just a chump scheme. Right. Actually, that moves me to, um, you know, if ever we go mainstream or even with the pace at which our own industry is going, uh, some of these challenges require regulation, require monitoring. And, uh, and of course, monitoring and regulation have to come at various levels given the global as well as local nature of impact investing. And how do you see that we can we can manage some of these potential uh, risks for impact investing as a whole, and uh, and avoid um, you know some of the crises uh, we we saw with microfinance in India or or some of the other potential crises that that, that could be staring us in the face. Uh, Vinita, I know you have quite a few thoughts on this, so uh, you can. Speak well, I think. Yeah, I think uh, let's actually be very clear. Uh, when you are dealing with rich, uh, you are always safe. When you are dealing with poor, you are always vulnerable. They are vulnerable. You are trying to actually do business with them. Uh, you have to take it for granted. The chances are that if things go wrong, you would be on the wrong side of the uh, of the of the divide. So I think as impact investors, we have to first humbly accept that if we go wrong, we should be held accountable. And if we if things will go wrong, the government will haul you. Now the question is actually, are we willing to actually wait till things go wrong? Or are we willing to self-regulate ourselves so that we can actually mitigate the risk of vulnerability that we can impose on the people we are going to work with? And I think that's really basically the debate where it needs to be pushed on. And I think the reason I continue to insist about actually going back and having clarity of what we are and who we are before we open the doors of mainstream capital to chase us before we actually open the door and start participating with very large biomots like Goldman Sachs and uh, others, I think the challenge really is to define what is it that you are doing and how would you manage the risks if and when you scale up. Dealing with this kind of population with very small fallets, with very high risk vulnerability, where anything and everything that you are doing for their own good can actually become bad for them. Microfinance very beautifully demonstrated to us in India that money in small quantities was good for the person. The same money in small quantities lended to the same person by 10 different people was bad for the person. How do you actually regulate that thought process? When capital will come from mainstream, it would actually be very severely competing against each other. It will take away the desire to actually make a difference to the individual. The individual will become a statistic, and the moment he becomes a statistic, his importance or relevance to the cause of impact investing will go down. And until as you have systems, processes, and risk mitigants in place, you would find it very difficult to really make the difference. And I think that's really the caution that we are trying to throw. And I may sound negative, but actually, I'm, as I said, repeated again, I'm a fairly optimist guy. I genuinely believe impact investing should scale, but I do not believe it is an industry. I hope and pray it doesn't become an industry. Uh, to me, it remains a movement within the main financial system. It is actually about taking capital and finding those people who have a conscience to use the capital for the right reason. If you go and look at the best venture capitalists in Silicon Valley or even in India or anywhere in the world, you would find those venture capitalists actually not really targeting an IRR. They actually invest in paradigm shifting innovations in great teams and entrepreneurs and then they expect our returns to be an outcome. And in case you find very good ideas and invest in very good people, chances are you'll make very high returns, not by chasing returns. Similarly, an impact investor is one who's actually find a great entrepreneur or a team of entrepreneurs, invest in them to support great ideas. Both impact and returns will be an outcome which neither I nor the entrepreneur knows about. And until unless we clearly understand this, we will continue to chase something that we, which will remain a mirage for all of us. Thanks, Vinay. That's very powerful. Um, uh, Kevin, what would your thoughts uh, be on, on on this topic, on monitoring and regulation? Well, yeah, uh, you, you want to not enable regulation by having good action that doesn't require regulation. I think that's 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 one thing you start from. 
but I think it's there's I guess I can tell two two simple stories that would illustrate where I think it needs to go. There's a a really clever technology being used uh, in Africa that is a huge time saver for uh, women carrying water rather than ha carrying the water on their heads. Uh, that it, it's it's a rolling thing and it's and it's large. And so at first glance, it seems like it's extremely valuable. It, it cuts something that can take two hours to you know twenty minutes or so. But actually, the adoption of that device has been. Uh, uh, extremely limited because that time walking to the water together is the only time that the women in that patriarchal culture get to be together and get to be unsupervised and this rolling thing makes it into a solitary uh, trip so you don't get to be together with your and so they're, they're saving the only valuable time of the week and that was one of the things where it was a well-meaning white entrepreneur who did you know what they call user-centric design but it was embedded in such a culture of privilege that, you know, the poor folks answered to the powerful white person, yes, that seems like it's great in the way that they do, but, you know, they don't mean it. It's just the way they respond to powerful people. That kind of well-meaning Stanford, MIT, Harvard student deploying technology and not realizing that the people are not going to tell you the truth because of who you are and where you're from should be stopped. And I think one of the things that I find really interesting right now, again, in financial inclusion, is a company called eMoneyPool, and there's several like this. And these are lending circles where people put up $100 a week, and in 10 weeks you get $1,000. Those exist in every immigrant culture in the U.S., and they have their own name. The Hmong have one name for them. The Filipinos have another name for them. And it's a technology being put out by two young men who are, uh, were immigrants from Jalisco, and that that's the only way their mother, who was outside the financial system, could save. So they understand it. They, un they know how to go into a community and sell that technology. So I think, you know, in, in the U.S., I think that people who are of those cultures, who understands the need of those cultures, can find places where the market can solve a problem. Right now, technology uh, in the U.S. is being put to good use. It's a place where market overlaps with justice in financial inclusion. That's a place that reduces the cost of being poor. You know, it, it's not debt, it enhances savings. So I think that, you know, we have too many well-meaning white folks out of colleges inflicting solutions without understanding that, you know, the people uh, that you go to are going to tell you yes because that's what they've been told to do and you don't understand the power embedded in your question. I think the more we have entrepreneurs of color or of different cultures talking to the people that they're, that they're working with, will have impact investing will become a tool by people who are of that community who are reaching that community. Uh, that, that's actually, um, Kevin, I, I'm going to pose another question to you just following up on this. Given the extremely diverse nature of impact investing, the, uh, the very large number of global participants, but uh, almost an equal number of local participants and the need to always contextualize when you're investing in impact or you're running a social business. Do you think there's a lot of tension between the local and the global or do you see them um, you know, as part of a larger whole uh, living more uh, you know, uh, peacefully with each other? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think everything is local. I, I think you know that's that's really the answer. Uh, I think the, the the two young men from Jalisco are spreading e-money pool across the country because they understand the cultural context. So I think cultural literacy is a way to to work that. Uh, they know how to reach those people. Keisha Cash understands the black salon market and understands where you can own a product rather than go send somebody off to a product and suddenly you're you know, adding 30% to your income. So I think it's cultural cultural literacy is the thing to look for. Local and global, you know, as, as one of the old things says, you know, all politics is local. I think all investing becomes local because everybody is buying within a cultural context or is not buying. And, and Vinith, what would your thoughts be on the global and local tension or merger? <laughs> Do the twins meet? 
I actually seriously don't bother about these things. Uh, I don't think so. This is so important for this. I mean, there will always be a conflict wherever two different uh, contexts this, and local and global, or local and local also conflict. So really, this is actually something that is not going to wish away, and it probably is not important really for the impact investing folks who are still trying to figure out who they are. So we can, we should limit our uh, conversations to our abilities rather than start solving the world's problem. Tomorrow we'll actually start. We stopped. You started using impact investing to solve Greece problem, and uh, <laughs> that's my fear actually. So, um, so, uh, so we'll actually we have uh, just about another uh, ten minutes to go. Um, I'll quickly update everyone on the result of the polls. It seems like about sixty percent of our uh, participants uh, think there is too much hype. Uh, or there is or may be too much hype in impact investing and about 37% say no. Um, so now quickly moving on to some audience questions. Um, this is a question uh, from Mukund Prasad. Um, he says that G8 governments and private investors are currently hyping up social impact bonds. Thoughts on this new concept where outcomes will be funded, not activities. Um, Kevin or Vineet, any one of you want to go for this question? Kevin, you want to take it? Well, I think in the U.S., uh, you know, the, our first, yeah, in the U.S., our first social impact bond uh, lost money and didn't create impact. And I think the results from the first recidivism bond in the U.K. show that it, it uh, had similar results. I think it's a paradigm-shifting thing. The, the idea of a social impact bond is that you go up the cliff and put in barriers rather than try to deal with the symptoms of somebody driving off the cliff. And I think it's, a, it's an approach. And the fact that it failed is kind of OK. Uh, I, I think it's a good approach. We, you know, we don't know. We, 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 we haven't proved that it works. But I think it's a, conceptually, I'm, 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 I'm uh, really, you know, it, it really appeals to me. I mean, it also shows, you know, Treatment does better than incarceration for drug use. There are all those sorts of things. This is trying to apply finance to that kind of thinking, and it's uh, it, it, it makes great intuitive sense. Unfortunately, you know, our, 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 it, it hasn't been proved to work yet. Vineet? You know, I think uh, impact bonds again are anything that is a new idea is actually welcome, and I think uh, there is a value to it. It's just that it's much more nascent than the whole act yeah. of actually using equity as this thing. So really, uh, hyping it is probably not the smartest thing to do, but then uh, the truth is that uh, it exists, and uh, there is actually some value to it. So. Um, great. So we have another question from Miranda. I agree. I think there's real value to it. And, 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 okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. I just I think there is real value to it, and and I think we, it it should be at least as valuable as you know a, a hidden particle that we don't know in science yet. I mean, there is something there we haven't gotten there yet. Um, and and just moving on to another question um, from Miranda, uh, she has a comment that says, "How do we increase the risk appetite for the second and third bottom line?" Standard VCs only need two out of ten investments to work uh, to be happy, but it is much harder to take that risk for social and environmental returns, given that the downside impacts life. This ultimately makes impact investing more risk averse. And she follows that up with a question saying, "How do we change the mindsets of investors to look at metrics and impact differently?" Um, Vinny, do you want to take that since you've uh, since you're an investor yourself uh, and uh, and you're also part of the Impact Investors Council. How do we help the impact investors to change mindsets? I think first they have to have a mindset for you to change it. Uh, and I think that's really the important question. The real question is not really whether their mindset needs to be changed. One question that you need to ask is, does an impact investor has a mindset? And if so, what is it? I think a lot of impact investors are basically disguising as impact investors. These are mass squandering as impact investors and not really impact investors. These are people who are out there to actually have a job. These are people out there who actually just want capital so that they can actually make impact. And I think this is really one of the challenges that you will continue to see. But those who have, an, uh, who have a point of view or who are actually trying to do something, they have their own challenges. And the challenges actually does not stop to the impact investor himself. It goes to where the capital is coming from. 
And I think there, that debate about what the capital is supposed to do and why and how it should be measured is actually an open debate right now. So the question is a very genuine one, but unfortunately the answer is a very long-winded one. Kevin, do you know how to change impact investors' mindset? Yeah, it, 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 I've got special water. You, 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 you buy it from me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, you know, it, 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 you always get this question of how do I change the minds of the people who are not in the room that I don't know? I mean, I, I try to avoid that question. I get it a lot, you know. How do we change the mindset of the people who are not in the room who are, who are enlightened like we are? It's like, well, you know, get out of the room, go talk to them, or just shut up. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a destructive question, and it's, and it's uh, the assumptions behind it are, are just, I try to avoid that question in all the forms in which it comes. Uh, uh, Kevin, there is a question actually uh, addressed to you, or probably something that you said, and since you are actually a white man yourself, probably it's a very Ooh. apt question for you from Chris Canstrip, right. if I'm not wrong. It's there on the... That's right. Uh, uh, I think I'll read you, it out, Kevin. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, okay. I think the gentleman that said that entrepreneurs should be of more minorities and different cultures, that isn't wrong, but he is forgetting that many people who are white have worked in development in these developing countries and can come up with solutions as well. I know he wasn't only saying that minorities know, but I think it shouldn't be based on race or culture but experience. Kevin, your thoughts or any responses to that? Sure. Some of my best friends are white folks. You know, I mean, you know, I, the, the 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 point is, uh, you know, I, I think you need to understand the culture in which you're working. I, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not saying white folks can't create impact. I think I've done okay, at least according to my, you know, compared to my peers on this kind of stuff. But I think we have a lot, you know, you have a lot of embedded cultural assumptions based on where you come from. There are a lot of people with tons of, you know. I, I, I can, you know, yeah, white folks can do good. Okay, fine, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have uh, time for just two more questions. Um, what role do large corporations have in pushing the impact investment movement forward, and how can impact investing be implemented within CSR? Kevin, do you want to take that? You know, it's something I really find interesting. I, I I haven't seen a way forward, and I keep looking for a way forward. I think there are some corporations who do it uh, pretty well. You know, Starbucks is 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 really trying to change the way it sources, and I'm familiar with that because of you know my pretty extensive fair trade experience. Uh, but you know, when you get down, so let's take fair trade as an example, because that's that's one of the ones that people look at. You know, the problem is there's a premium. You know, it costs more to to do fair trade coffee and so therefore you have to have a value around the people often brown people who uh, are are growing your beans and so uh, that gets into the behavior change kind of thing you know how, how do you get those people to care more about the people who are not in the room that they don't seem to care much about so uh, you know the places where it, it impacts seamlessly and easily with uh, with the market reality are great. I you know and the places where where demand moves in are, are great. I mean I, one of the places we've seen behavior change in the U.S. rapidly is is around you know LGBT rights and 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 that's a group whose rights are uh, uh, are are moving forward really rapidly and and we're moving backward on uh, black civil rights. So uh, it, it gets into you know. How can you sell them? Can you get a premium around them? And, and, and if you can't get a premium around them, how can you justify it? Those are the questions that that, that I that I that I get uh, stumped on when I try to go further with the corporate folks. So, uh, you can do a lot of CSR demonstration projects, and those are not bad in, in the, of themselves. They're, those are those are that's just what they are. It's it's CSR window dressing, and, and that's you know it's not insignificant. It's not terrible. It's, it's nothing. It doesn't change anything. Vineet, do you have any thoughts on, on how to engage corporations? Well, I think uh, corporations are very big giants, and uh, I think uh, it, it's a slow process. So let's actually, uh, I mean, see, in India, CSR has actually been mandated by the government. There are people who are spending 2%, and uh, some of them have actually decided to look at uh, impact investing. Uh, but again, if you're a large corporate and you're actually looking at impact investing, uh, since you are reputationally very sensitive, 
people are extremely risk averse to investing in it. The question is, if somebody like me has been approached by a found, uh, or by a large corporation who is extremely risk averse towards any kind of experimentation, then what kind of an impact investor would I be? I think that's really the kind of questions we are all grappling with. Uh, there is a lot that can be done by impact by CS by by the corporations, but not by actually pushing their CSR budgets. But probably, like Kevin mentioned about Starbucks and others, they need to really try to make themselves responsible in the way they are conducting their business. Uh, I think they all mouth the right words. The challenge is whether you can actually inculcate that as part of your habit. Some institutions do it well, some don't. So I think the challenge remains from that perspective. Whether impact investing is the right thing for large corporates is actually a question. Uh, Vinny, there's also someone who says that she may be able to offer you $5 million and if she does, what would you be so, why would you be so eager? But I think the question behind uh, what, what, I mean, the essence behind what Vartha was trying to ask is what is it about an LP that appeals to you when raising money for your funds? Well, there are three things. First, you should have money. So if a person has money, that appeals to me. The second is the person should actually, should, should, but the person should actually ask me the right questions of what I'm trying to do. And third, should actually be as supportive when things go wrong with us. Uh, we have actually seen multiple times limited partners with capital actually are very jumpy. So there are a lot of people we have said no to from raising money, not because they are actually bad people. It's just that they are not really necessarily uh, aware that the kind of risk we are going to carry. And there will be ups and downs. So really what you need for is from a limited partner is an ability to understand the challenge and be by your side when things go wrong, exactly like my entrepreneur expects me to be. So that's what these are the three <laughs> Great. And, and just to wrap up um, uh, the last two questions, one is do you think such a thing as conscious capitalism exists and what, what are your thoughts on that? And then we, we go into closing comments. Um, Kevin and me, do you think a thing like conscious capitalism exists? I'm not really sure of the term. I mean, it was popularized by uh, the, the founder of, of uh, Whole Foods, and it has a particular meaning. I, you know, it, lots of isms are stuck in the old mindset that created them. And I think capitalism right now is stuck in a neoliberal way of looking at things that only thinks about uh, financial return and is allowed to uh, put its externalities, its cost, onto the world, which is causing climate change. So uh, I think we can use capital and we can use the market for our goods, but I, I, I avoid any ism that already has 500 years of history and say, you know, we'll change that. And I think we have to change, we have, we have, to, we have to make capital a tool and not a force of nature in the way we think about it. Uh, Vineet, your thoughts on conscious capitalism? I really don't know much about it, but it all sounds similar to impact investing, etc. I think the nomenclature is a meme. I'm actually not a definition guy by nature itself. Uh, there is a lot of problems in the world. Let's actually act upon it. There is enough capitalism and there are enough academicians who should be asked these questions. I'm probably not educated enough to answer it. So. Great. And, and just to, uh, to finally uh, wrap up, um, Kevin and Vineet, what would you say uh, are the two things you want to see change from impact investing 1.0 to impact investing 2.0. And uh, and just before you answer, we have a question for all our uh, participants on has impact investing done well given the nascency of the industry so far. Please do select and if you have any specific comments on, on your answer, you can put it up here and we'll, we'll compile, uh, put it up in the chat box and we'll compile it. But now to Vineet and Kevin on two things that you want to see change. Um, from impact investing 1.0 to impact investing 2.0. I'll, I'll, I'll go with, uh, I'll go first and I'll actually give you my examples. The two things that I want to change about Avishkar and myself. In last uh, a decade or more, all the investments we have made were basically not taking any risks to shift paradigms. We were basically taking execution risk and trying to support entrepreneurs do what people have been doing well with minor changes miniaturizing hospital to reduce capital asset lockout, create uh, artisanal ownership, etc., etc. They sound great, but they were neither paradigm shifting nor were they new. Uh, we have not taken any risk that would actually change the status quo 
very significantly. So if one thing I'll want to change, I would like to actually invest in paradigm shifting innovation that can really bring about uh, a monumental change just rather than an incremental change. Not saying incremental change is bad, this is actually asked from myself. The second thing I think is I have actually personally been fascinated by being small, cute and uh, a bonsai. Uh, I would rather like to scale up and see ourselves scale up and become larger, able to attract larger capital, which requires us to actually raid our thoughts a little bit, uh, probably be a little more dishonest than what we are. Uh, I think it goes to Kevin as well, uh, because the world in general does not like too much of honesty. And I think uh, uh, the first point probably people will appreciate, the second change people will not appreciate in me. But these are the two changes that will allow us probably to become more successful. Kevin, your thoughts? Yeah, what would I want in Impact Investing 2.0? I, I think, you know, it's like we're maybe where in the U.S. feminism was back in the 80s when people were going for dress for success and, and uh, rather than uh, creating independent personality. So I, I think we don't need to think about going mainstream. I think we need to think about, as Benit said, you know, system changing kinds of things. But I think that also means changing the dominant metaphors and memes. I think we're stuck with an old metaphor. And, and so the, the more that we say we want to be like what capitalism is, that you know, what the Goldman Sachs of the world are, uh, we'll be going down the wrong path. You know, the market solves some problems. And we should be realistic that the market doesn't solve all problems. But say, where can entrepreneurs solve some problems and work on those? And, but I think it is, it's limited. You know, uh, the market doesn't solve all problems, but the market does solve some problems. So I think realistically saying we only solve some problems would be great. And then fundamentally, you know, trying to be non-extractive. You know, I think we need to change the time signature around venture and sort of have some way that venture is patient enough to work on the timeline that impact also works on. Great. Um, on, that, uh, on that note, um, I want to thank both you and Vineet for making the time um, to uh, to participate and for all the participants uh, who joined us today. Thank you so much for making the time. I hope the conversation was, was interesting to you all. Uh, we will share um, uh, the recorded version soon and very quickly just summing up uh, the results of the uh, poll, uh, about 25% we've done well and about 72% say we've done moderately. So I think uh, on, on that positive note, uh, I think Impact Investing has done fairly well and there's a lot more for us to do and learn. Um, and, uh, and and thank you so much, Kevin and Vineet, for joining us. Um, and uh, and we look forward to hearing more at both SOCAP and Sankar. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Vineet. This was fun. Yeah, that's what's fun as well. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Thank Bye. you. Right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.